Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church, and on behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, and each officer and member of this church, we're just so blessed that you are joining us for our General Sunday School Lesson Overview. Uh, each week, uh, we are hoping to uh, share with you the Word of God through our International Sunday School Lesson. Uh, we've been uh, at it for four years now. We just thank God for the uh, technology and the ability to continue to share with you. As always, we thank you for your support, your presence, but most importantly, your prayers. Uh, we ask that you would consider uh, turning on notifications and subscribing to our channel. You did all of our content, our Wednesday evening Bible class and our Sunday morning worship experience where you're here teaching and preaching from our pastor, Dr. Bacchus. We have a wonderful lesson today. It's entitled Power Without Equal taken from the 40th chapter of Isaiah. And I would like to call this one of those rip from the headline lessons where it really speaks to some things that we're going through in uh, today's world as we seek to uh, try to make our way and find comfort in the midst of these uncomfortable situations. So again, the lesson is entitled Power Without Equal. It's taken from the 40th chapter of Isaiah, verses 12 and 13, and then verses 25 through 31. And reading from the New King James Version, our key verse, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29 reads, He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. And so our goal, uh, today's lesson, first we will examine the tension between the, uh, the, the power of God and our own trust. Secondly, we will commit to renewing our trust in God when we wait for him to act. And then third and finally, we will commit to modeling trust and patience in God's timing. And so we'll begin with prayer and jump directly into our lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to study your word. Father, we confess that we have fallen short, that we have made mistakes, that we have sinned against your will. But we thank you that you woke us up this morning with brand new graces and brand new mercies. Now, as we dive into your bread of life, as we seek to understand your word, help us to apply it to our hearts, to our faith, and to our living, that we might be better lights in the midst of darkness shining, that others might see our good works, but glorify you, our Father, who is in heaven. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It is in your darling and precious Son, Jesus Christ's name, that we pray. Amen. Amen. So our lesson in Isaiah chapter 40 pits up in the, towards the end of the Babylonian captivity. The children of Israel have been uh, captured by the Babylons, uh, Babylonians, excuse me, and they, they brought them out, uh, and they, they've been outside of their land. They've been forced as slaves uh, to worship idol gods, uh, to uh, bow to the king, uh, to abandon their way of life, to leave the land that has been promised to them. And they have determined within their own minds that the reason for their circumstances is because of their sinful past, their rebellion. Uh, and so while suffering under the hand of Babylonian captivities, they made up in their minds that their past sins were so egregious were so uh, large in scale that God had abandoned them and they had deserved to be in the condition and the circumstances that they were in, that they were too bad or too sinful to be saved. And so in response to their own determined fate, which they figured that they deserved, they saw no reason to live according to God's law. They began uh, to become lazy in their worship. They began to uh, stop building homes. They stopped getting married. They stopped having children. They kind of gave up and lost hope. But Isaiah prophesied to them that hope was not lost at all and that deliverance will come and salvation was at hand. And the reason why this lesson is so important, especially in times like this, is as we look at the circumstances of the world in which we live in, when we look at the economic impact uh, that society has on people that look like us and live in our communities, as we look at the education disparity, as we look at the income disparity, as we look at the war in Israel and Gaza, the war in Ukraine and Russia, now this uh, tension in the Middle East as the United States has just launched zone, uh, drone strikes and hit targets throughout Syria and, and, and the Middle East, it, it, it makes us believe that perhaps the sinful ways of the world has caused us to be in a position where we deserve what's happening to us. And that's just on a macro global scale. When we look throughout our own history and our own past, sometimes 
we become so discouraged by our mistakes and our shortcomings, especially the things that we do when we know better, the things that we have no business doing, the things that God has delivered and freed us from or revealed to us in our life does not belong. It's so easy to make up in our minds that this situation that we find ourselves in is deserved. However, Isaiah preached to the children of Israel uh, thousands of years ago and even to us today that regardless of your past, regardless of your mistakes, regardless of how far you stumble, God is still in control. God sees us and he cares about us and that all we have to do is seek out his will and become obedient to his commandments and that deliverance is not uh, beyond our reach. And so if nothing else today, let's all be encouraged that regardless of the mistakes that our community, that our country, that our city, that our nation, that the world has made, regardless of the mistakes that we've made internally and externally, whether we've hurt ourselves or hurt others, all we have to do is recognize our wrong, turn away from those things, seek out God's will, and God loves us enough to not only forgive us, but to uh, help us recover what has been taken and put us in a position that he had, uh, that, that, that represents his plan for our lives and not the enemy's plan of destruction. So our lesson is broken down into four different parts. Uh, again, we're in Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, first will be verses 12 through 13, and then verses 25 through 31, and all of our scripture will come from the New King James Version. The first part of our lesson is entitled, Where is God when we need him most? Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 and 13 reads, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains and the scales and the hills in the, in the balance, who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has taught him. So again, the effect of ba Babylonian captivity, uh, the, the word that I saw when I was doing my study that most uh, was the most accurate to me was demoralizing. It really rocked the children of Israel to a point where they had uh, no hope. So if we look at Nebuchadnezzar, we're familiar with his story uh, from the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 1, uh, Daniel was unable to interpret the dreams in, 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 immediately, and so he was uh, threatened with being killed. And he asked Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to pray for them, them knowing the seriousness of his predicament. In the next two chapters, we see these three Hebrew boys refusing to bow to this idol god, and they were thrown in the fiery furnace. And so we saw early on uh, in Babylonian captivity how God really stepped in to protect those that remained faithful to him. But if we look more closely at the details of their situation, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, was considered one of the uh, first rulers of the known world. Uh, when you look at the, historically, you got the Roman Empire with Caesar, you have uh, the, the, uh, the Genghis Khan, and then you have uh, the Babylonian Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, the Egyptians. Uh, so early on uh, in, in early history, there were really about four or five different nations that conquered the known world, and the Babylonians were one of them. The reason why the Babylonians were so successful in their conquest was because they did not just engage in battle and overtake lands. What they would do is they would take the no nobility, uh, so all the princes and princesses, uh, those that were rich, those that had uh, good stature in their nations, they would take them back to Babylon, indoctrinate them with Babylonian culture, and then send them back out as visitors or representatives of the Babylonian nation. And because of this process, they were able to not only infiltrate other nations, but really change the way that other nations operated. And the children of Israel uh, historically had been uh, known to be persistent in their faith and in their culture, even in the times in which they found themselves in captivity. But Babylonian captivity was so different, it was so harsh, because any rejection of Babylonian culture or refusal to worship Babylonian gods would result in death or uh, punishment, uh, harsh punishment for both the individual and the people. And so the children of Israel, after 40 years in Babylonian captivity, they were really overtaken by the Babylonian culture, and they had made up in their mind that this was so un unlike the Egyptian captivity, and so unlike the times when the Assyrians and the uh, uh, the Macedonians and the uh, the, Phili the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Philippians, uh, it was so different because they weren't just telling you what what you had to do in terms of paying tribute and being underneath the rule of of their oppressors, but they had to literally take on the oppressors' culture. 
It's very similar to what happened in American slavery. American slavery was not unique in the fact that it was the only form of slavery. As a matter of fact, most of the free world had some form of slavery. Matter of fact, the large percentage of Africans that were taken from the continent were actually slaves where they were at. We, uh, many of our ancestors that were brought to America were slaves that were captured or s bought, purchased and then brought here. The difference with American slavery is they made us change our names, our faith, uh, our language. And because of the effects of slavery, uh, we, we no longer had a connection to our history, to our past, to our ancestors. And we're, we're talking about a 400 year impact when we look at American slavery, but when we're looking at this uh, uh, occupation of Israel and Israel, uh, uh, the Israelites' captivity in Babylonia, it was 40 years. So 40 years forced to worship these idol gods, forced to uh, pray when they were told to. They could no longer pray according to the law and the commandments, and they, it was demoralizing. They no longer wanted to hear about the power of God. They stopped worshiping, they stopped praying because they believed that their past rebellion, their past rejection of God, of, uh, of Yahweh, put them in this position. And so there are times in our lives where we determine for ourselves that our own mistakes, our own shortcomings, uh, puts us in a position where we deserve less. And so if we look at it from an economic perspective, uh, if I spend all my money and I don't pay my bills, I deserve to have my lights cut off. That's a cause and effect. If I spend all my money and don't pay my car note, I deserve to have my car repossessed. In my mind, I recognize that my own mistakes has put me in a position where that is the circumstance that I must endure. However, from a spiritual perspective, the children of Israel applied this worldly concept to their faith. Because they had rejected, because they had been disobedient, because they did not worship as they were commanded to, and because they did not follow the commandments of God, the children of Israel determined within their own selves that the situation they found themselves in Babylon was, uh, was deserved. And they no longer even cared enough to hear about God's power and God's goodness because it wasn't evident in their lives. Now, just because you're not flourishing or just because things aren't going well or just because things aren't going according to your own plan for your lives does not mean that God is absent or ignoring your situation. It just means that God's plan is sometimes different than our own plan. And it's not up to us to force our way onto God, but it's up to us to understand and receive God's plan, God's will for our lives, and to operate within it. And so the children of Israel, rather than hearing about the power and the glory of God, they really want, were in a position where they just wanted to know if God still cared. And they could ask themselves the question, does God even care? Is he watching? Why would he not step in? And what were they uh, able to do to kickstart the process if it was even able to be started again? And so the prophet Isaiah, when he speaks to them in this 12th and 13th verse, he's trying to remind them that God is still able. The same God that had previously done the miraculous things when he freed them from Egyptian captivity, allowed them to escape Pharaoh's army, allowed them to uh, de uh, uh, defeat uh, the, uh, I, early I said the Philippian army, uh, I meant the Philistine army, so excuse me. But uh, when I talked about Philippian captivity, I meant Philistine captivity and, and, uh, and, and occupation. But when God allowed David to defeat Goliath and the Philistine army, when God allowed the children of Israel to recover the Ark of the Covenant, there's been such a long and steady history of God's favor for his people. And so Isaiah's trying to remind them that the same God that has done all these things that we've celebrated and studied and learned about throughout history is the same God that still oversees us today. And so we have to look at what God has done and help us remember what he is able to do. So these statements that Isaiah gives them, it reminds us of who God is. And, and we know these things, but sometimes we forget about them. Uh, just because God is not doing the supernatural in our lives in a way that we expect him or desire for him to do, does not mean that he's ignoring us or that he's absent from our lives. Now, no one can know God's plans from the creation of the world to the salvation of its inhabitants. God has a plan 
for each and every day of our lives, for each and every moment, and each and every second of our lives. And it's up to us to learn to trust God's plan for our lives, even when we don't understand it, even when we're uncomfortable with it. We can trust that God's plan for our lives, even in the times where it's difficult to survive through it, it's always going to work out for our good. And so he really ends this first part of our lesson by reminding Israel that no one is mightier than God. Even the, uh, the, the, the gods of Babylon, even these false gods that they lift up and that they worship, the sins of the Israelites, nothing is mightier than God's power in our lives. Not our own sinful ways, not our own mistakes, not our own idols that we lift up and worship or the things that distract us from God. None of those things are more powerful than God. And Isaiah is really trying to remind Israel that I know you're uncomfortable. I know you're in a demoralized position, but you can too survive this. And God is still in control if only you recognize that his power has not faded away. So the first part of our lesson is where is God when we need him most? The second part of our lesson is who in the created order is equal to God? Isaiah chapter 40, jumping down to verses 25 and 26, the text reads, To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number? He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, no one is missing. So God asked a question through the prophet Isaiah, who is equal to God? Or he's really asking in the first person, who's equal to me? The com the, their complaints were based on their circumstances, and it caused them to doubt God's power or his sovereignty in their situation. Now, again, the children of Israel recognized their favorite position. And at this point in God's plan for salvation, they did not yet recognize that God's desire was to save all of creation. They really un only understood God's uh, salvation and the plan that he had for eternity as, as, as solely for the children of Israel, his favorite nation. And so they understood their circumstance as they had lost favor with God. And now in their minds, they were no different than the other nations. They were outside of God's favor and no longer God's favorite nation and therefore beyond salvation. And so they begin to break the commandments. They begin to intermingle with the Babylonians and the other nations that the Babylonians held captive in their land. They became lazy in their worship. They began to cross boundaries in their worship and worship idols or follow Babylonian culture in their worship practices. And, 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 and Isaiah is stepping in, speaking and, uh, the, or God speaking through Isaiah, reminding them that no one is equal to God, not these false gods, not the things that they are now starting to appreciate and starting to worship, but that God stands alone, that he is all powerful. And so they really say, look to the stars, look above and recognize the glory of God. Uh, one thing that amazes me is I, I, I kind of like to do a, a research, uh, sometimes I'll go on YouTube or I'll get on Google, I'll get to reading or watching videos, I'll find myself down a rabbit hole and I'll, I'll, I'll just, something to catch my attention and I'll just go further and further and I'll know something about a topic that I never even thought about before. Uh, I was watching a video the other day uh, about the difficulty in raising the Titanic, uh, the, the famous ship that had hit the iceberg and, and sunk. And uh, a famous quote said that it would be easier to lower the Atlantic than raise the Titanic. As a matter of fact, uh, we know about the Leonardo DiCaprio movie about the Titanic, but there was a second movie that literally bankrupt, bankrupted a movie studio. They spent almost 40, 50 million dollars trying to uh, study and observe the Titanic underwater. And it was just so difficult of a task, they weren't able to do it justice and the movie was a flop, of course, the documentary, and it ended up costing uh, the movie, the movie theater went out of business, went bankrupt because of it. But in, in that research, or when I was learning about the attempt to raise the Titanic, uh, it was shared that 95% of our ocean uh, is uncharted or unknown. And when I started to think about that, just on this earth, and, and, and just think about that. Imagine 95% of your home or 95% of your city or 95% of your car 
or 95% of your bedroom. Imagine if 95% of something was uncharted. And when we look at the vastness of our ocean, it just it, we can only imagine what is there that we have never seen, or what animals, or what species, or what fish, what, uh, what, what mammals are in the water that we've never even observed yet. And when we take it from the ocean, to the sky, to the birds, to the stars, to our galaxy, to our universe, to all of creation, only God knows what he has made. And even with all our education, with all our technology, we're so limited in our knowledge. And Isaiah's trying to remind them, like, listen, I know you guys have tried to make up in your own mind why you're in this situation. I know Israel has tried to uh, come up with a, a reason that the circumstances of life has affected them in the way it has, but only God understands what's happening. Only God knows the vastness of space and the hairs on our head and the, the drops of water in the ocean. And so the gods of their enemies, Isaiah lifts them up as examples of the limited power outside of the true God, the one true God, the God of Israel, the God that we worship, the God that has... Uh, saved us through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. So these false gods that Israel has now begun to cling to, these false gods that the Babylonians and the enemies lift up as examples of God, they, they, they would make idols out, the, out of these gods. And Israel would be, uh, uh, Israel by law were, uh, were, were not allowed to make idols of God because there was nothing that could really capture the glory of God. There was nothing that could uh, encapsulate his power and his strength. Uh, if we were to make an idol out the, out, out, out for God, what, what, what would we even begin with? What material could we use? The, the, the purest of gold would not be pure enough. The, 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 the largest statue ever would still be too small. Uh, and, and so we, we must recognize that the God that we serve, the God that has shaped us and formed us, the God that has created us, the God that has created all, uh, he's so large, he's so big, he knows all, he knows everything. And so don't become discouraged by your situation and start to limit the power of God. And that's really what Isaiah was saying. He was saying, don't let your circumstances, don't let your situation dictate how, how you see God. Uh, what I've come to learn in my life is that regardless of what I'm going through, it doesn't change the God that I serve. And whether they're self-inflicted wounds and what I'm suffering through is because of my own mistakes, or whether they're external in their nature, that I've been doing the best that I could and bad things just happen to find their way in my life, I still trust in the power and the might of my God because as I look back through my life, whether it was me or others, regardless if I intentionally fail or mistakenly fail, God has somehow picked me up and dusted me off and started me back on my way. And I trust in God's power to do what he's always done. That's give me the victory and deliver me from whatever had me bound. So we see where is God when we need him most. We just looked at who is the created order, who in the created order is equal to God. The third part of our lesson is God does indeed watch over his people. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 27 and 29 read, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. So just as God sees all, he governs all, and nothing happens outside of his will. Isaiah is trying to remind uh, uh, Israel that nothing is beyond control of our God. We sometimes think the absence of action means neglect or lethargic behavior on behalf of God in our lives. And that's because we tend to look at our circumstances in life and compare what we go through in this world to what we go through with our God. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example, and perhaps I should have had one coming in. But when we see other people 
witness our struggle, we expect them to do something. And when they don't do something about it, we make up in our mind that they don't care. I'll give you an example. Just this morning, when I was driving into church, there was a car that was trying to get over coming down the on-ramp. I saw him coming down the on-ramp. I saw his turn signal. Yet, I was still going at my same pace. I didn't slow down. I didn't speed up. And he was forced to slow down and get behind me. In his mind, he probably thought that I didn't care enough about his situation to make an adjustment in my travel. And the truth is, he was right. Perhaps I should have slowed down and let him get in. Perhaps I should have sped up so he wouldn't have had to slow down. But I was so comfortable in my own thing that I didn't make an adjustment to make him more comfortable. And oftentimes in life, we see things like that and people not adjust for us and we assume that they don't care or that they're neglectful or that they're so caught up in their own thing they don't have time to worry about our thing. And sometimes we put that mindset on our faith. And when we see the struggles that we are going through in this world, when we see prayers that seem as if they're unanswered, we, we start to think that God doesn't care, that God isn't paying attention, that God is neglecting us. It's easy to think that the absence of a response from God constitutes an abandonment by God. But God never abandons us. God never ignores us. God sees all, he knows all, and he cares about our situation. And even the enemies of God, while appearing to prosper, they're still under his control. And so God is in control of all things. And therefore, instead of being upset or uncomfortable in our circumstances, we should instead trust in God that he's being patient, that he's waiting, that he's going about it his plan for our lives, even though we may not understand it. So what God is able to do has been seen and it's been experienced. We know what he's able to do. We know the uh, strength of his might. We know his power. We know his deliverance. We know about his salvation. And therefore, the victory and the deliverances that we have experienced in our past can propel us and give us the strength that we need to continue to trust in God and our future. It contradicts what the world sees. Even though it might seem that we're laboring or we're struggling or we're, uh, we, we're, we're almost out of gas, God loves us enough to know what we can handle and he knows when to step in. And it's up to us to trust in him even when we don't understand what he's doing. God does not get tired or bored, but rather he operates according to his own plan, to his own purpose, and for his own glory and for the salvation of all of his creation. So we first started, where is God when we need him most? Who, is the created, who in the created order is equal to God? God does indeed watch over his people. But our lesson ends with our fourth point, the unlimited energy of God versus human potential. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 30 and 31 reads, Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So Isaiah ends our lesson by convincing us to be patient and trust in God's plan. The songwriter said it best. God may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. God cared and he was willing to step in, but it wouldn't have been according to Israel's plan, but it was according to God's own plan. Uh, like a, a child waiting on a parent to fulfill a promise, it's up to us to trust that our parent, in this case, God will do what he said, and to trust that the waiting game or the patience that's required is for our own good. I remember I used to uh, tell my mom I needed a new pair of shoes, and she would say, all right, we'll go get you a pair. And I would think that that meant that day, or that meant that there was time to jump in the car and go directly to the store. But my mom would recognize that if she got me a pair of shoes that day, I'll probably mess them up. And the new semester, the new school year was just two or three weeks away. So she would wait two or three weeks. All the time I'm thinking, did she forget what she said? Did she forget what she promised? Was she not honest with me? But she recognized that what I needed, I would probably mess up if I got it when I wanted it. But she gave it to me when I actually needed it for my own good. And that's just what God does. 
Even though we may not see it or understand it, sometimes God gives us our breakthrough, our deliverance, our, uh, uh, our blessing for when we need it and not when we want it. So when we depend on our own strength, uh, and that's what this 30th verse meant, even when the youth shall fail and be weary and the young men shall utterly, utterly fall, Isaiah is reminding them that when they depend on their own strength, their own strength proves to be insufficient. Israel tried to do it their way. They tried to make allegiances with neighboring nations. That didn't work out. They tried to go to war outside of God's instruction. That didn't work out. They tried to gather their own wealth. That didn't work out. They tried to appoint their own king. That didn't work out. They tried to do things in the way that they thought they should do, and each time it did not work out for their good. And so when we depend on our own strength, our own ability, our own uh, tactics, it never works out. We need to trust in God and recognize that it's his strength that we need to overcome the situations that we find ourselves in. It doesn't mean that we sit idly by and wait on God to act or to step into our situation, but it means that we become active in our faith, active in our trust in God. That We put our faith into action by operating according to his will, by doing what he's called us to do, being who he's called us to be, and trusting that he'll step in and turn our situation around in his own time. As we seek God out and move forward in obedience, God increases our faith, our endurance, our perseverance, and even our patience to survive the things that we find ourselves in. When, our, when we're strengthened in our patience, we're able to endure what we did not think we could endure on our own. In Philippians chapter 4, verses uh, 13, Paul says that I found the strength to endure both good and bad in Jesus Christ. And therefore, because I found the strength, I'm able to do all things through God who strengthens me. He's able to survive whatever comes his way, trusting that it will always work out for his good because of the strength of God in his life. So our hope is lost when we think our future is based on our own actions or our own abilities. And Israel fell into sin and determined that their actions removed them from the favor of God. The truth is that if it was up to them, they would never be good enough or obedient enough to, for, to receive forgiveness and deliverance. But in spite of Israel's mistakes, God loved them enough to grant them favor and to grant them a deliverance. But it was according to his plan and his purpose for their lives. Our faith is not built on what we can do ourselves, but instead our faith is built on what we aren't able to do. It's a recognition that God saves us, that he stepped into eternity, that he saved us through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, only because we were not able to save ourselves. So therefore, instead of just de depending on our own might, our own power, our own righteousness, or our own goodness, we submit to God's will, we seek him out and obey his commandments in appreciation and submission to his plan for our lives. Because God's plan, God's power, God's pardon of sin and God's provision is evident even in the midst of difficult situations. And so Isaiah reminds Israel, I know you struggled. I know these 40 years have not been the best of situations, but trust in God. He has not abandoned you. He still sees your situation, and you're not so far removed from him that you're beyond salvation. And now that's such good news for us today. I know we may not understand what we're going through, some of us have been struggling for weeks, months, years, maybe even like Israel for 40 years. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't think that God is neglectful or has abandoned you, but recognize that God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. And it's up to us to trust in his plan, to be obedient to his word, and have patience because the breakthrough, the deliverance, the victory is, is ahead. Uh, again, I don't know what you're struggling through, those that might be listening and watching, but we can boldly claim and stamp our, uh, put our stamp of approval on what God is going to do in our lives. And, and I don't know if it's sickness, if it's depression, if it's economic or health, if it, whatever you're struggling with, you don't have to be slave to your situation. We can know that God is able like the three Hebrew boys that we mentioned in Daniel earlier. I don't know if my God will, but I do know that my God can. And if we take that approach to every situation in our life, every relationship, every sin 
that has us bound, every struggle, every shortcoming, every, every, every time we fall and stumble. I don't know if God will deliver me or will give me the breakthrough or will give me the victory, but I know that he can. And that's good enough for me, trusting in God's power, trusting that he has not abandoned me, trusting that he has not neglected me, and trusting that he cares enough about me to give me the victory according to his plan for his glory in my life. What a wonderful lesson. I'm very uh, encouraged, very much so encouraged by this lesson. I'm just thankful for all that God is continuing to do in my life. Uh, again, like all of us, I, I stumble, I fall short. I, I, I have my struggles, but I'm thankful that God has not abandoned me, that my sins have not removed me from his presence and that his victory is still evident in my life. We thank you so much for worshiping with us today in our study. We encourage you to join us in worshiping and your giving. We have four ways for you to support the work that we do here at Friendship. You can give on Cash App, Dollar Sign Friendship Chicago. You can give on our website, www.fbcchicago.org. You can text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462, or you can mail your check and money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church, care of Dr. Reginald E. Backus, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. As always, we thank you for your support, for your presence, and most importantly, for your prayers. Uh, please consider joining us for our other worship experiences. Each Tuesday morning at 8 a.m., uh, Reverend Aaron Davidson leads us in our prayer call where we ask for God's will to be done within our uh, uh, body of believers here at Friendship and throughout all of creation. Our men of faith, our brotherhood meet each Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. Our women of faith meet each fourth Tuesday at 7 p.m. And then we have our weekday, uh, excuse me, our midweek Bible study each Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. And then, of course, we would love for you to join us either live or through our Facebook and YouTube pages each Sunday morning at 11 a.m. for our live worship experience. And then we're so excited today. Uh, we have a candidate for baptism, two candidates for baptism. Uh, uh, one uh, young lady and one young man. And so we're just thankful for God's increase uh, to the church in general and then God's increase to our body of believers here at Friendship Baptist Church. As always, we thank you for, again, your presence, your support, most importantly, your prayers. And if the Lord says the same, we'll see you next week, same time, same channel for another Sunday School Lesson Overview. Uh, let's end in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that has been said all that has been done. Father, help us to remember that regardless of our situation or our circumstances, you love us, that you see us, that you care about us, and that you have not abandoned us. So give us the faith to be perseverant. Uh, give us the faith to uh, be steadfast. Give us the faith to be patient and trust that even though you may not come when we want you to, that you're an on-time God. And so we look forward to the victory, to the breakthrough, to deliverance in our life, trusting that all things happen according to your plan for our lives and for your purpose. In your son's Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. God bless, and we'll see you at 11 a.m. for our live worship study.